During the spring of 1964, a touring exhibit visited the then relatively new shopping centers in 19 cities around the U.S., showcasing Chrysler technical innovations, including the 426 cubic inch Hemi engine that had recently been introduced, but the obvious focus of the exhibit was on the turbine cars and the driver test program. The company's promotional campaign went as far as giving away 1 25th scale models of the turbine cars at the exhibitions and to interested people visiting dealerships. The test driver's families were given several. Meanwhile, in July of that year, a car driven in testing at Chrysler's Chelsea Proving Grounds near Detroit logged 100,000 miles. Compared to the more abstract futuristic design concepts exhibited by competitors, visitors seeing Chrysler's presence at the 1964 World's Fair in New York must have certainly felt that a true car of the future was on the horizon. The company's massive six-acre exhibit featured a display of the company's full lineup of cars in addition to two of the turbine cars, a test track for demonstration rides, and even giant models of an engine in a car. Over 18 million people visited the exhibit over the course of the fair, with 350,000 visitors actually experiencing rides in one of the turbine cars. In sharp contrast, the General Motors exhibit focused on futuristic imagery rather than actual cars, and that company's previous exhibit in Seattle at the 1962 fair included their Firebird turbine cars only as a static display. Confusingly, the general press was far more positive about the cars than the automotive press. The automotive press focused on the car's limitations, such as slower quarter-mile times compared to a V8 of the period, as well as slower 0-60 to 60 times, with some sources reporting 12 seconds. When objectively compared in those situations to their piston engine powered contemporaries, however, the cars performed equally well. However, the company was secretive about that due to concerns about the test drivers being tempted to drive the cars under those conditions and risking damaging them. The turbine engines could accelerate very rapidly from a standstill. Such a practice is referred to as brake torque or revving the engine in place then releasing the brakes. This strain was more on a piston engine car equipped with an automatic transmission, but the lack of a torque converter on the turbine car allowed it to be done without risking damage to the drivetrain. To illustrate this, a race between a turbine car and a V8 equipped Dodge was staged in California, with both cars driven from a brake torque start and the turbine car outperformed the Dodge. The general press reported on this positively in contrast to automotive publications dismissing the race as a mere stunt. The automotive press at the time also ignored the car's ability to run on a variety of fuels, except for the novelty of the test when the cars were run on tequila or perfume, although in fairness, gasoline was extremely cheap during this period, prior to the energy crisis and shortages in the U.S. that came later during the following decade. However, during the test period, one driver took advantage of the car's ability to run on different fuels and avoided fuel availability problems by having a local Texaco gas station order a 55-gallon drum of kerosene that was used during the three months he had the car. By this point, the program had advanced far enough that the company was developing maintenance procedures and the manuals for use by dealership repair technicians. However, the possible sticker price of future production cars was estimated to be about $20,000, equivalent to about $191,000 today, which is still very high compared to car prices of the time, which ran in the $2,000 to $3,000 range, or equivalent to about $20,000 to $30,000 today. The test cars were very expensive for the time, estimated to have cost $50,000 to $55,000 each to build, those cars today would have cost almost half a million dollars each to build. Out of the 55 cars built, besides the five used by the company for testing, 46 were actually used in the consumer test program, while two of the cars are displayed at the World's Fair, and two were exhibited during promotional tours. 
On April 12, 1966, Chrysler held a press conference in Detroit announcing the results of the driver program and the driver's experience with the cars. Most users were impressed by the smooth ride of the cars as well as the lower maintenance required compared to that of a car equipped with a piston engine, such as the turbine engines not requiring tuning or oil changes. Drivers were also impressed with the car's rapid starting, even in cold conditions, as well as with how fast the heater warmed the interior almost instantaneously. Despite some complaints about the sound of the engines, the cars were still noted for being much quieter than their piston engine contemporaries. Problems reported with the cars included poor gas mileage and slower acceleration, although these were problems known to the company prior to the start of the test program and it was felt that those issues could be solved. The vehicle's lack of air conditioning was also another issue, but as noted in part one, this was due to the engine having insufficient power to drive an air conditioning unit, and that as well was seen as a problem that could be solved with future development. However, despite these problems, company executives were ultimately optimistic that those issues weren't insurmountable and were as enthusiastic as the drivers themselves were about the cars and at the press conference the impression was given that production of a turbine car for the public was close to becoming a reality. In 1967 the order was given to scrap the cars. According to a later disproven account the scrapping of the cars was ordered to avoid massive import taxes due to the bodies having been made overseas. However, a more plausible explanation is that it was carried out to avoid having the cars in possession of private owners and ultimately being retrofitted with V8s when the turbine engines failed in ruining the image of the cars and the turbine project. One Chrysler vice president stated that their main objective was research and they did not want turbines turning up on used car lots. Besides that explanation, it is in fact standard practice in the auto industry to, to scrap prototypes and test vehicles, which ultimately the turbine cars were. This was evident as the scrapping was carried out despite offers to buy the cars. Despite the company's offer of the cars to museums, only five public museums and one private collector expressed interest. Three cars were kept by the company, with one kept at their Chelsea Proving Grounds and the other two at the company's museum in Detroit. An additional problem with producing turbine cars at the time, as well as allowing the test program cars to end up in, in the possession of private owners, would have been the need for a team of specialist mechanics and a line of spare parts for what would have been a limited production run. Following the consumer test program, there was pressure from some in the company to add a turbine car to the 1966 product line with the company's fifth generation engine and there were some suggestions that what ultimately became the Dodge Charger would enter production with the turbine engine. The Charger was produced albeit with a conventional engine although with some speculation as to how just likely a turbine engine version of the Charger might have been. In 1967, the company revealed their sixth generation engine, which had a reported performance comparable to a V8 of the period and was rated at 150 horsepower. Emissions were still a major problem with excessive production of oxides of nitrogen, which are the result of continuous combustion in a turbine engine. The company alluded to the possibility of a test run of, of Dodge Coronets equipped with the sixth generation engine and one 1960 Coronet was built with the engine installed. While seemingly unremarkable since this was a standard production car with a turbine under the hood, unlike the negative reaction to the Ghia cars from the test program, the automotive press response to the turbine-equipped Coronet was interestingly more positive. Overall, the sixth generation engine represented an improvement over its predecessors with greatly improved fuel efficiency, faster acceleration, and reduced noise. Auxiliary drives drew power from the power turbine rather from the compressor turbine as was the case with the engines in the Ghia cars, resulting in the improved throttle response and lower noise, as well as giving drivers more of a piston engine feel due to better engine brake. The improved power from the auxiliary drives also allowed for the use of a conventional 12 volt electrical system rather than the 24 volt system that was used in the Ghia cars. The 1967 turbine equipped Coronet was used for several years in testing. 
The engine was also tested in a Chrysler Imperial. However, that car was too heavy for the engine to perform as well as it did in the Coronet. Ultimately though, despite the overwhelming positive reaction the cars received from both the test drivers and the public, development problems proved to be insurmountable and most crucially, the need for costly exotic materials for the engine and fuel efficiency problems as well as emissions problems continued to plague the turbine engine project. Along with those problems, the potentially high cost to the company to proceed with the production run of turbine cars and the high sticker price even if enough cars could have been produced to justify a production run would have greatly limited the potential customer base. Defeating the goal of making the turbine car part of everyday driving and what might have been the car of the future became a part of automotive history without ever being produced. As for the final fate of the surviving Ghia turbine cars, nine cars are still in existence. All of them are from the group of 50 cars from the consumer test program and none of the five prototypes exist. The cars in museum are rendered inoperable with their fan assemblies having been removed. Nine of the cars survive and are in museums and private collection. Including one operational example owned by television host Jay Leno. Attempting to build on their lead in automotive turbine engine research, in November of 1972, the company was awarded a $6.4 million grant from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to pursue making turbine engines that would comply with the new emissions regulations. A sixth generation engine was installed in a 1973 Aspen four-door. This car featured an improved transmission solving the problem of power loss at high speeds as well as being used to test electronic engine controls. The car received positive reactions from reporters who test drove the car However, the potential sticker price of the car unfortunately would have been $300,000 or roughly today equivalent to about $2 million. By 1976, the goal of meeting emission standards with the turbine engine had been met. Despite this, however, the company losses mounting in the face of massive quality control issues meant they had the technical background but not the financial resources to move forward with mass production. The company's seventh generation turbine engine represented a major improvement in materials research, incorporating ceramic parts that were as durable as the exotic metal components used in previous engines. One of these engines was installed in a 1978 Chrysler LeBaron, and another engine was used in a concept car for the U.S. Department of Energy. By 1979, the company reported that most goals had been met, although that year's emissions regulations had not been met. Despite the advances, however, changes in regulation were outpacing the already challenging work being done making the cars run cleaner. Chrysler's bid proposal detailed the issues to be addressed and optimistic about solving all of them except for production and cost, and the company was still uncertain as to the possibility of moving ahead with mass production at a cost in line with conventional cars. It was stated in its proposal that if the other problems were solved and the decision were made to move ahead with production, 300,000 units could be produced. In 1980, the U.S. Department of Energy released a report covering the results of the Advanced Gas Turbine Project Car. Potential fuel economy and improved emissions reductions were focused on, as well as the range of fuels turbine engines could use, including both petroleum-based and synthetic fuels. The Department of Energy was prepared to approve funding to auto companies and related firms with mass production slated to begin in 1991. Unfortunately, by 1981, political interest had waned and funding ended, and Chrysler's automobile turbine engine research was terminated. By this time, the piston engines that the turbines were meant to supersede had advanced far enough to comply with stricter efficiency and emissions regulations. 
It was claimed that the company was on the verge of mass production of turbine engine cars as early as the 1966 model year, even in the face of the prohibitive cost of mass production of critical engine parts, but remaining optimistic because of the encouraging advances in solving the other issues with the engines. The already extreme cost of specialized processes to manufacture turbines parts was exacerbated further by financial problems in the company during the 1970s and ultimately the company could never have afforded it. In Chrysler's most profitable year, the company made $422 million. The estimated cost to begin mass production of turbine cars is estimated to be at $1 billion in the late 1960s or early 1970s or about $7.5 billion today. Other companies during the same period also pursued turbine vehicle projects, although not to the same level that Chrysler had. The overarching problem with turbine engines is that they were too expensive to mass produce in the numbers needed for cars. Over the 30-year course of Chrysler's turbine research, 77 turbine-powered cars were built over the years of development work, with 23.8 million spent over the course of the program. In the end, although the car of the future is ultimately not a part of our present, Chrysler-built turbine engines are used to power the M1 Abrams tank, which are able to run on a variety of fuels. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and check out the other videos on this channel. And always remember, when the future was cool,